attitude. We are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Seamus and Notch is a great idea. Hello and welcome to the Debated Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will, and in this episode, I'm joined by the Member of Parliament for Luton South, Gavin Shooker. Welcome to the podcast, Gavin. Thanks for having us, Will. Um, So to begin with, I'd like to ask, there's been a lot of uh, tumult over the recent days and weeks with prorogation and Brexit in general. Do you think that politics is just becoming more and more chaotic the further we go along? Or do you think things are beginning to stabilise now? Well, look, you know, we are in the midst of probably the biggest constitutional crisis uh, for more than 100 years. I mean, the, the answer as to how, <laughs> how we got here um, is pretty long and convoluted, but I think it's quite instructive because it probably informs you that this is in a sense the new normal certainly for the next few years as far as i can see um you know you've got a zombie government uh, without a majority mm. you know it's got worse since boris johnson obviously sacked uh, 20 odd of his own backbenchers but even before that you know over the course of this year both the major parties have been shedding mps i'm one of those mm-hmm. formerly from the labor party um and you've got this piece of legislation the fixed terms parliaments act that basically, uh, you know, uh, keeps a government on life support, even when it wants to switch off the machine. Mm-hmm. And in that context, uh, a general election is very unlikely to get a clear, decisive result. Mm. I suspect that we're trying to handle this with one arm tied behind our backs. Mm. Um, you know, that bit of legislation is has kind of blocked the fire exits. And I suspect that this will be the case even in the next parliament as well. Um. You uh, recently uh, written a piece about the situation, and in it you say that essentially just going for a general election isn't the right idea because Boris Johnson is more likely than not to to win and to have a a fairly substantive uh, majority. You suggest that what should happen is um, that we should have sort of like a, a people's vote and then a general election next year. Um... Uh, Do you think that in such a circumstance that there may be people who feel that this is Parliament um, blocking the people from having uh, a right to say on what perhaps they might want to say, like a a general election, uh, and conflating that with the issue of having a referendum, that the idea of a referendum is sort of used as a means of just preventing members of parliament from possibly losing their seats well look it's probably a problem with my writing rather than your reading of it um because <laughs> because my my hunch is not actually that um boris johnson would get a majority mm. more that he's likely to be leading the largest party but again in a parliament with no overall majority um now i may be wrong and in our constitutional system we hit the big reset button in the middle of a constitutional crisis and that's a general election I can't think of a similar occasion where um, the outcome has been so uncertain to deliver a strong and decisive result. So Mm -hmm. I suppose that's kind of my first argument is why you need to go to a people's vote Um, is that the normal, the normal things that you would reach for in this kind of crisis, I just don't think are going to work in the same way. Um, Mm -hmm. The product of both parties kind of going off to the extremes and 10 years of, fragmentation and all the rest but but that's the first reason the second reason actually kind of a bit more straightforward really um which is this that you know boris johnson wants us to be able to leave without a deal and i look at that result in 2016 i look at the general election in 2017 i look at the current makeup of this parliament and i just don't see a mandate for it now that isn't to say that you know i get to block it because there isn't a you know a mandate there it's to say there needs to be a mandate for something at this point. And in a sense, if it's about Brexit, you know, have a vote on Brexit. Um, mm. If he wants a mandate to leave without a deal, come what may, great. You know, he's got the ability to do that through a people's vote. But mm. at the minute, the reason why this whole thing is gummed up is there isn't a mandate to kind of do anything. Um, and you can't hold Parliament, you know, in contempt for doing its job. Mm-hmm. 
Um, do you think that if there was uh, a caretaker government, as uh, you suggest in the piece, and a lot of people have been suggesting, that as people have been questioning the um, uh, legitimacy of Boris Johnson to govern, that perhaps there might be questions over the legitimacy of uh, such a caretaker government, and that might make anything that it enacts open to suggestions that it's not representing what people want. Well, you know, this is politics, and in politics mm. people will uh, pick up any argument and throw it at you. So I'm <laughs> I'm quite right, you're, you know, I think your assumption is correct. Some people say, oh, it's illegitimate and so on. Mm. But there is only really one test in our system of whether or not a government is legitimate. It's whether or not it can get its business through the House of Commons. Mm-hmm. Um, and before the Fixed Homes Parliaments Act back in 2011 which I have to mm. say I'm one of only about 40 MPs that voted against. Um, and I'm mm. feeling quite uh, pleased about that kind of a decade mm. on. Um, before that, a government that can't get its business through is proven to be illegitimate and has to go to an election. Mm. Now, if you, you know, if I, if my numbers are right and if my hunch is right and my conversations are right, it's entirely possible to get a legitimate government out of this House of Commons by mm. pulling together... Uh, you know, in the short term, six to nine months, an administration that had representation from Labour, the Lib Dems, uh, you know, Greens, one of the many independents of which I'm mm. one and so on. The truth is, though, that can't be led by Jeremy Corbyn. The numbers just aren't there. And mm. if he wasn't leading the Labour Party right now, this would already have happened. So mm. uh, on the question of legitimacy, two things. First of all, legitimacy to do what? Well, we know what the answer to that basically is. It's a people's vote probably in the spring and then a general election in the summer. Um, but secondly, legitimacy stems from whether or not you've got political potency in the mm. House of Commons. And Boris Johnson doesn't have that in spades. You know, The numbers just are not there anymore. And mm. in any normal time, we'd have replaced him months ago. Um, now, of course, you mentioned Jeremy Corbyn there. And there's a great deal of argument as to whether if there was a caretaker government, whether he would be um, Prime Minister of not. And of course you oppose that as many uh, other independents and Liberal Democrats do. But there are uh, other options. Um, The names of Ken Clark, Dame Margaret Beckett, Harriet Harman have been floated. Is there anyone of those three named or anyone else that you think you could see yourself voting for as an interim Prime Minister? Yes, all three, um, you know, uh, and many other names that aren't discussed at that point. Hmm. You know, people think that uh, people like me are being intransigent when we say, uh, you know, Jeremy Corbyn just doesn't have the numbers. But the the Hmm. truth is, even his own numbers in his own party are soft, right? So, Hmm. you know, we're living in a world where there's 240 odd Labour MPs that are willing to vote confidence in Jeremy Corbyn. Hmm. But actually, that hasn't been tested yet. And... You know, I've been at the heart of this thing. The numbers just aren't there even on his own side, let alone with everyone else piling in. Now, Mm. that changes quite rapidly when you start talking about someone that's going to come forward, is going to pass a withdrawal bill as it currently stands, subject to ratification of a people's vote, and Mm. has a clear timetable to put elections in place. Um, You know, I think any of those three are credible, um, But actually, I I think there are are many other names as well because it's linked to their actions and their instincts. Mm. Um, Now, a lot of people have suggested that the the figure that would be a caretaker prime minister would have to come from the Labour Party as the um, largest opposition party. Uh, Do you think that it necessarily does have to come from the Labour Party? Or do you think that if there was to be um, such a coalition that the matter of which was the largest party somewhat becomes irrelevant and it's more important that the person is going to go there and do what yourself and the rest of the um, MPs want? Well, in constitutional terms, it makes no difference at all. You know, we're all members of Parliament. Mm. We've all got an equal chance, an equal right. In reality, I suspect that the cost of kind of putting together that coalition would probably be someone from the Labour Party. But equally, that's insufficient to get you the numbers. So it would need to be, I suspect, someone that is, you know, 
not going to be considered to be a threat by the Labour Party mm-hmm. from within the Labour Party after the next election. In other words, someone that is probably wise and experienced is is the mm. euphemism, but probably old. Uh, <laughs> someone you know, someone that is going to be stepping down the next election. Um, and you know, you mentioned a few names there. Equally, though, I mean, I, you know, I would push this agenda myself, but I don't see why you wouldn't have an independent. Um, you know, who's very clear about their future ambitions and in, is in a sense kind of insulated, you know, mm-hmm. very little chance you're going to be re-elected as an independent. Mm-hmm. Um, and to be honest, if someone came forward and said, all right, well, I'll be prime minister for the next nine months, but then I'm off. I can think of quite a lot of people that would happily take that bet. Mm, yeah. Um, speaking of the, the fact that there are so many independent MPs, a lot of um, former independent MPs have joined the Liberal Democrats. Is that anything, something you've ever considered? Yeah, of course I've considered it. Um, you know, when we left to form the independent group, uh, you know, people forget now because it's a bit of a punchline, but uh, before it became a political party, actually we did that with the expectation that there would be others in other parties and other events mm-hmm. that would force others to become independents. Now, mm. looking at this end of the year, back at the start of the year, I think that premise was pretty bang on, right? Mm. You know, just look at the the numbers, you know, you can plot it out. Now, why did we do that and not just join the Lib Dems? We thought there was space for a broader realignment that absolutely included the Lib Dems, mm-hmm. but needed to be a, a broader coalition than that is. Now, the jury's out in my mind. Does, does this Lib Dem party want to be that broader coalition? Does mm. it want to replace the opposition and be a credible party of government or does it want to be a strong Lib Dem party Mm. now I think uh, you know a lot of people obviously that are in the Lib Dems now not only are good friends but I've been very close to and working on this project this year Mm -hmm. Um, I've said if there's a snap general election I'll stand as an independent in my own seat Mm. Um, but do I want them to do well in the current climate absolutely because I think both legacy parties have gone off to the extremes and it is not clear to me about how they come back at this point Mm. Uh, now of course a lot of them uh, of the members of parliament who have joined the Lib Dems recently were previously part of Change UK Um, what are your feelings about Change UK at the moment well you know I mean in fairness to those MPs that decided they wished to carry on with the political party element of what we had done, Mm -hmm. you know, they need the space to get on and to build that out and so on. My assessment was that, you know, following those disastrous election results, which I have to say some of us predicted quite clearly before we went down that path, Mm. um, you know, that it just would not be seen as a credible national option. And the scale of what you've got to build to do that is utterly huge Mm. so i wish them well obviously um i I, you know just just as a commentator rather than a participant i find it very very hard to see how those mps will be able to build something out about it but Mm. look you know we're in pretty odd times at the minute and uh, you know for me it was always about establishing a broader realignment not just building a smaller splinter party and, uh, you know, I really regret the way that the years played out in that sense. Mm. Now, um, moving away uh, from Brexit for a moment, you've been a very strong opponent of uh, the EDL and other uh, far-right uh, extremist groups, both in your own seat and uh, across the country. Do you think that the, uh, the way that these groups operate has changed recently and that there is more emphasis on their activities online rather than um, street protests as used to be the case? Well, you know, bear in mind, uh, you know, I've lived in Luton all my life. I grew up there. It's how I ended up being the MP there. And of course, uh, you know, 2010, 2011, we saw the English Defence League kind of really emerge in a serious way out of Luton. But to be honest, you know, you can change the name of these guys. They just morph and become whatever the far right is in Mm. each and every generation, whether it's the National Front or Britain First or, uh, you know, 
uh, Combat 18, th- these are groups that are driven by an ideology. What's changed in my period of time as a member of parliament is the legitimization of many of these views and the way in which they've crept back into politics mm. and then flow back a- into you know the activity of the far right. So I agree mm. with you. There's obviously been a shift away from street protest into online activity. Um, but we shouldn't underestimate the threat that's there. You know, bear in mind that for many of us, we've seen one of our colleagues assassinated in an act mm. of domestic terrorism by the far right. Um, and so, you know, I, people have kind of got very upset about how het up various different MPs were last week and the week before um, in terms of the Prime Minister's comments about traitors mm. and, you know, all of this kind of language drives this cycle of violence and extremism. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us to actually guard our language and try and prevent these institutions being captured by the extremes. Because if there's a lesson from the last decade, it is that very extreme elements want to get hold of you know, political concepts and parties and ideas mm. and they're receiving an electoral reward for it. Um, that doesn't make it okay. Mm. Um, now, in the previous uh, podcast, we spoke to Lee Jones from the Full Brexit website, and he suggested that the link between um, the um, to hate crimes and Brexit, and in, in general the far right, was perhaps somewhat overplayed. What do you think is the connection, if there is one, between the far right and Brexit? I mean, I think the referendum unleashed um, a different kind of debate in our country that has always Mm. been there, absolutely. But there is just a huge difference between it happening, uh, you know, in the sidelines while, you know, the the political figures of the day condemn it Mm. and those that are willing to lean into it. So if you look at what the big, you know, I helped coordinate the, you know, the in campaign, uh you know regionally to me and i spent about six months on the road around my region and knocking on doors and you know uh actually the big drivers there were immigration the big things Mm. that were coming up on the doorstep were not 350 million pounds for the nhs Mm. or sovereignty or anything like that it was turkey it was people are going to come from other countries and uh we are concerned about that and scared about that there is a legitimate argument to be had about levels of immigration and so on. But mm-hmm. can any of us with a straight face look at where our country is right now and not say it's a more extreme place, a more divided place, and that actually many of these concepts embodied in the hard right have been given legitimacy uh, by the actions of that campaign? And, you know, I, I don't really feel I've got you know an axe to grind about it or mm. some position that I need to assert about it I think it's just plainly obvious um, and I think when you unleash demons like that you've 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 got to be honest about it um, you know it's not just mm. the leave campaign though right you know look at our politics yeah. more generally it has gone to the extremes left and right and unless we're willing to be honest about that and face up to it we're not going to tackle it mm. and now you mentioned the um, remain campaign the in campaign and of course uh one of the leaders of that came, uh, campaign was David Cameron, who has recently come out with his uh, autobiography. And he's spoken a, bo- a lot about how he felt that the referendum was just going to happen, that there were no questions about it. Whatever he did, it was inevitable. Do you think it was inevitable? Yeah, I'm reading the book at the minute, actually, because I'm quite interested in uh, you know going back and reviewing that period of time, obviously, mm the time in which I sat in Parliament and, you know, seeing his thought processes as well. Uh, To my mind, no, the referendum was not inevitable. Um, I think Cameron had a bad strategy in terms of negotiating. Um, You know, it's a it was an odd sequencing to go and try and negotiate something where there was no pressure on the EU and then come back and try and sell that deal. But the Mm. prevailing wisdom was, well, don't worry, you know, Remain will win. And I think mm. that's what he lent into most strongly. And bear in mind, you know, a bit like with, with Blair and kind of the military interventions that he fought, people mm. forget it, but he had three very successful military interventions before the mm. fourth one, which was the Iraq war. 
mm. you know Cameron had a, had a series of kind of things that you can't pull off which he did including the Scottish referendum and you know um you know tackling his own party and so on and then it goes bad and and you see this mm. pattern with leaders that they they learn to kind of repeat what it is that they've learned how to do and the tactics work every time until they don't yeah. this was this was unfortunately a uh, this was a gamble that you just cannot afford to take um and i think there's a lot of people even those that would vote uh, to leave uh who look back on that period and go you know what has the cost been hmm. do you think that if we were to have a general election and somehow in in some circumstance regardless of the polling Jeremy Corbyn did become prime minister do you think that there would be any positives from a Corbyn led administration or do you think that it would just be fairly negative so in those circumstances um because i think it's very hard to imagine you'd get a majority labor government mm. you would obviously have to do a deal with the smp Mm-hmm. So that's Scottish independence on the table. Uh, you'd have to find an accommodation with the other parties. I, I suppose my argument is not that there are not things that could come of that that would be good. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm I'm basically someone on the soft left. You know, I, uh, mm. I'm not I'm not even in that kind of cent- centre left kind of space. Ed Miliband was mm. probably closest leader to my politics, mm. um, and so you know some policies are appealing. My issue is the cost of that, right? And this is mm. the argument I've had with my own colleagues and people that have stayed in the Labour Party, which is you are willing to throw other people and other groups under the bus mm. in order to get what you want around, like, I don't know, renationalising water. Well, like, good for mm-hmm. you, mate. But actually, look at the approach on anti Semitism, you know, the mm. instinct on national security the willingness to use the machinery of first of all a party but it would be then a government mm. to crack down on dissent and those that disagree you know these are hugely seriously scary costs mm. and i actually think that there is i think there's a great shame actually in our country that we allow him to be leader of the opposition let alone prime mm. minister and uh, you know each and every one will make their own choice uh, mm. they'll have to give an account for why they've made that choice but I've had too many conversations with too many MPs that say, I agree with you and we must do everything we can to prevent Jeremy Corbyn being prime minister. These are people in his own party. But, comma, I've mm-hmm. got three years left to play, pay on my mortgage, right? Yeah. I'm just done with that. And I cannot understand how people can say, well, it's just, you know, a nice little on the one hand, but on the other scenario. This really matters for a huge group of people not least of all the most marginalised in our communities. Hmm. Do you think that the difference that perhaps it makes to you as opposed to other MPs is... um, I know that you have a a deep and very personal uh, faith. Do do you think that that's perhaps the sort of, like, the the difference that that you have perhaps a more... You know, a, 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 a sense of right and wrong that is entrenched in your own uh, Christian belief system that means that you could not accept something like that? Well, I've always said that there's space for morality in politics, but Mm. not a whole load of space for moralising. And Mm. uh, that's been the approach that I've always tried to take in terms of working out my own faith in relation to this place. Um, And so, you know, I don't want to sit in judgment on other people and how they approach it. I would say Mm. this, though... You know, for me, the issue was never could I be like reselected within the Labour Party as mm. someone that was known as a critic of Jeremy Corbyn. The issue was could I, with any integrity, submit myself to be reselected, right? Mm. Could I go yeah. out there and campaign for someone that I believe to be utterly abhorrent mm. uh, for the future of our country to be elected as Prime Minister? Now, other people have answered that question as yes, I can find a way to fudge that. Mm. And I never could. And so in a sense, you know, it was inevitable for me that I couldn't remain as a Labour MP um, because I've got to look at myself in the mirror for the next 
I hope 50 years, but mm. increasingly it feels like shorter and shorter in the current climate. <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's that's surely a far more pressing uh, kind of concern than anything else that you could do mm. right now. And And I just think, I think people that aren't facing up to the reality of what they're doing are deluded. I just think, mm. you know, they will find all sorts of way to square off this issue. But the issue is is within them right it's not external yeah. it's an issue of basic integrity and uh if you want an answer as to where we've gone wrong in the last you draw the line 10 20 30 years you know how long has this crisis mm. been coming i think it's people that have steered away from facing up to the reality of it and the reality that they're likely to lose their jobs if they do follow it through um mm. for me that's that's just not that's that's not sufficient an argument to do something that i know to be wrong uh, well, we're coming towards the end of the podcast now. Thank you for being on, Gavin. It's been a very interesting discussion. And I've got uh, one last question that I would like to ask. Um, we talked about the idea of an interim prime minister, and you floated the idea of it being an independent. If you became prime minister of a caretaker interim government, what would your three pi- priorities be? I mean, I think... To be honest, in an interim uh, setup, it answers itself. You know, the first thing you've <laughs> got to do is seek an extension. So the second thing is you've got to legislate for uh, the people's vote in the spring mm-hmm. and then legislate for an election in the summer. So that's mm-hmm. your three. The one thing I would just add, though, and it's quite important because I think people miss this. There mm-hmm. is a really legitimate argument that says, look, you know, we asked the British people they gave the wrong answer the first time so we're going to keep on asking them um, Mm -hmm. until it's right or you know the best of three argument or you know what will you do now I think this is why it's so important that you've got to have something that can be legally enacted on the ballot paper Mm -hmm. either way and that was really the problem with the last uh, you know the last referendum and Mm -hmm. so for me I think you take the deal that the EU have put in place you enact it in parliament you go through all of its stages you work it out so it's watertight and you say mm. it will come into effect the day after that referendum. Uh, and then you put that to a people's vote to get a mandate yeah. for it. Without that, I think those of us that are on the Remain side, you know, are completely open and exposed on that argument. And so if you want to know why uh, that would be your three priorities, you're going to need time to get that piece of legislation through. Yeah. There isn't going to be a lot of bandwidth elsewhere in government to do the other things, the things that I came into politics to do, mm. like try and drive down poverty and increase educational opportunity and, uh, you know, see a transformation, uh, you know, renewal of our institutions and so on. Mm. And that's the huge tragedy of where we find ourselves right now. All of this effort, all of this time going into getting us out of a mess when we could have been actually doing really incredible things, the things we came into politics to do. Well, on that note, thank you for being on the podcast, Gavin. It was a, a delight to have you on. Thank you so much. I'd also like to quickly add that one of our former guests, Jasnet Samray, has started a new campaign called For a Better Politics, which is a cross-party campaign that is being launched on the 24th of October. It's going to be a mainly digital campaign, um, predominantly via social media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. And its aim is to push a more inclusive and positive model of politics, and one that focuses on debate and not abuse of political opponents. If you'd like to get involved, then I would suggest you contact Jazz. Uh, You can email her, uh, jazznetsamurai5 at gmail.com. I'll just spell that out. Uh, J A S N E E T S A M R A I 5 at gmail.com. I'd strongly advise you to um, at least look up the campaign, if not get actively involved with it. It's a fantastic campaign and one that we here at Debated fully support. Uh, if you want to uh, subscribe to the podcast, you can do so on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. You can follow us at Debated Podcast on Twitter and email us at the debated podcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Hope you listen to the next one.